Good evening. Um, thank you all for joining us this um, S2S Yale Law School admissions webinar. I am Christine Schwartz. I'm the CEO of Service to School. So Service to School is a veterans nonprofit and we are focused on helping veterans on their journey to higher ed. So our mission is to, pr to prepare veterans and transitioning service members for their next chapter of leadership by helping them gain admission to the best colleges and grad schools possible. Through that mission, we have partnered with some of the country's best universities to ensure that we reach veterans who are also in pursuit of that mission. And we are really proud to say that this includes Yale Law School. So a huge thank you to Yale Law School for joining us on this webinar and recognizing how important it is to have veterans in your classrooms. Tonight, we are joined by Yale Law School's Dean of Admission, or Associate Dean of Admissions, Miriam Ingvar, as well as their Director of Admissions, Eric Barba. We also get to hear from three veterans who are current Yale Law School students, Paul Zeb, Tristan Hood, and Annie Guillard. Awesome. So in a minute, I will hand the mic over to Dean Ingvar, but while I have you all in a captive audience, I do want to spread the word of Service to Schools work a little more. So I understand that most people on this webinar are considering law school or graduate schools, but I do want to point out the incredible program that we have for veterans who are considering undergraduate degrees. If you have a friend or a peer who's looking at colleges, if you are currently an officer and, or an NCO and you have soldiers, sailors, Marines who are interested in college, please tell them about service to school. We are so proud of our undergraduate program. And last year, 52% of the veterans we worked with were first generation college students who went on to amazing schools like Yale undergrad, Stanford, MIT, Amherst, and dozens of other great colleges. So as always, our program is completely free to veterans and service members, and we look forward to supporting you and all veterans. Okay, so I'm mostly done with that plug. Other than to say, please follow us on social media. We put a ton of content on LinkedIn, Instagram, um, you know, links to admission advice, other webinars, whatever support you might need. So now I will hand the mic over to Miriam and thank you again. Hi. Okay. So I'm going to start. Um, this is our, my first time I'm going to say this is my first presentation, our first recruiting presentation of the year. So I'm going to apologize in advance if it's a little uh, sloppy. So bear with us. And then I want to say a huge thank to both Christine and to Casey for organizing this and for hosting us. We're really super thrilled to be in partnership with Service to Schools. Um, it's just a huge priority of the institution, um, starting with Dean Gherkin, the Dean of the Law School, uh, through everyone in our office to really try to uh, get as many uh, service members uh, into the law school and so we're really excited to see all of you here and we really hope that this is a helpful resource for all of you. So let me just quickly say what the plan is. I'm going to do a really quick uh, presentation. It's an abridged version of a longer presentation. Um, I'm happy to circulate it. We uh, Afterwards we'll get a, I think a list of email addresses and we have one that's a little longer with some audio and we can circulate that afterwards. And then I'm really going to turn it over to Tristan and to Annie and to Paul uh, and you can ask them any questions you want about their experiences at the law school, their experiences applicants, and also you can ask me and Eric any questions you have about uh, the admissions process and about the law school that maybe uh, we can answer too. You can type questions into chat. I'm also happy to answer them um, if you want to you know, ask them out loud, but that can get a little a little crazy with so many participants. So we'll just we'll just see what works best. All right, let me see if I can share screen effectively. Okay, and then someone will tell me did that work? Christine, can you give me a thumbs up if you can? Okay, good. I got a thumbs up. All right, here we go. So literally just today, we released the stats on the class of 2023. They just started school this week in a very um, kind of a crazy time in a hybrid environment. So we're really thrilled to have them at the law school. So it's a, we usually admit um, about 200, 200, just over 200 students a year. Um, oh, and look, I can see a typo already. I did not change class of 2022 in that thing. So Eric, please make sure you've helped me remember to fix that. But it is the class of 2023. You can see the numerical stats, which are all obviously, they are what they are. We're very intentional about including the low LSAT and GPA as well as the high. Um, and I note that because different schools uh, have very different ways um, of grading. And so, for example, service academies, which some of you may have atten attended, have, you know, 
no grade inflation whatsoever. They tend to have much lower GPAs. That's something we're very attuned to. Um, and so, you know, we are trying to show that we admit people for, with, with a very wide uh, range of backgrounds. The low the year before was a 3.33. That number fluctuates quite a bit. Um, and I wrote down our vet numbers uh, for the year. We have eight incoming vets, three from the Army, three from the Marine Corps, and two from the Navy. Those numbers are a little bit low because we actually had a lot of vet deferrals. Um, we had a couple of people who were either called up or couldn't get out of the military as they had planned. So we actually, I'm hoping are going to have a really big class the following year with all of the incoming deferrals and hopefully we'll be able to admit um, quite a few this year as well. I'm hoping for the quadrifecta of all four service branches. And we did admit people from the Coast Guard this year, but um, they deferred into next year's class. So we'll see how we do for next year. All right, so that's the class of 2023. And let me go on. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, studying at YLS. Uh, so this is just some of the things that we think really differentiate uh, uh, Yale from other law schools. So one thing we really pride ourselves on is having a really hands-on learning environment. We have a little bit of a reputation for being a theory school, and I think that that's a little bit of a dated reputation. It's not untrue. I think it is true that we uh, have a very sort of intersect faculty who focus on it, the law in a very high level intersectional way, but we also have an unbelievable array of clinics. We have about 30 clinics. Almost all of our students participate in at least one. You can start to take clinics your first year of law school in the second semester. It's, as I said, a pretty small class, and the classes are also really small. Last year, only four classes were more than 100 students, um, and there's about a four to one student to faculty ratio, which is awesome. Uh, it's also very collaborative, and a lot of that is driven by our grading system. So the first semester, it's credit fail, um, and usually, although last spring was different because of uh, the pandemic, usually after the first semester, it moves to an honors pass, low pass fail system, which is really Really different than most schools and there's no curve no rank and so that really creates uh, or takes away a lot of the grading pressure that I think law school often has a reputation for creating so I think that's that's pretty cool and I'll let the students talk more about what that's like. Okay, so the first term. So as I said, there's no grades that first term. Uh, one of our professors uh, says it really nicely. She says it's almost like a practice semester. It's not that you don't work really hard or students do work really hard but it's really to practice and to learn how to learn. Uh, law school is like almost learning a second language. So it's an immersion in the language of the law. People are just gonna start talking at you day one, using all sorts of terminology that may be really unfamiliar to most people. And that can be really jarring uh, for everyone. And so it's really nice to have a semester with no grades when you're really acclimatizing to that kind of education. You take four classes. Uh, starting this year, those four classes are civil procedure, constitutional law, contracts, and criminal law. Uh, and one of those classes which is assigned to you is what we call a small group. And that is usually about 17 to 18 students. So just as an example, my assigned small group was constitutional law. And I then took all of my other classes with my small group as well. So for example, when I went into torts, other small groups joined me as well. And so those were larger classes. I hear my four-year-old screaming. So if you hear that, I swear no one's being tortured. He probably wants like chips or something. Um, okay. So after the first semester, you can take whatever you want. We're, I think, one of the only schools that has only one semester of required courses. You can, uh, and I mentioned already what the uh, grading system moves into, and there's very few other requirements before you graduate. You do need to take torts before you graduate. You have to take a professional responsibility requirement, and you do, and this is very Yale specific, have to write two major papers supervised by faculty before you graduate. Okay. And we'll, we can elaborate on anything that's sort of of interest as um, uh, later on. I want to talk very briefly about financial support. A lot of this um, may not be applicable to many of you because we do um, uh, support the Yellow Ribbon program fully. So we have no cap either on the amount of financial support or on the number of students in Yellow Ribbon. But I know that the, the way that applies uh, is very individual. So I'll mention this just very, very briefly in case the Yellow Ribbon program isn't applicable to some of you. So we have a totally need-based system. And what that means is that we don't provide merit aid to anyone. Um, everything we do is need-based. And that includes uh, uh, fee waiver. So if any of you want to request a fee waiver, you should feel free to do so. It's, it's based on need. That includes academic year aid, unless you're, of course, through the Yellow Ribbon Program. It includes summer uh, funding for public interest work, and it includes a loan repayment program after graduation. And that's just 
a, a very deeply held value of the law school that the, the faculty feel very strongly about, that uh, every one of the law schools is equally meritorious, and so no aid should be based on merit. Uh, and the loan repayment program in particular is really intended to create maximal career opportunities after graduation for our, all of our graduates. Okay. So as I mentioned, there's sort of three primary financial aid programs. There's the academic year aid, which is need-based. About 73% of our students um, last year were on financial aid, and six, over 60% of those were receiving scholarship. And the uh, median scholarship for 1Ls coming in was about $30,000. We have sort of guaranteed summer public interest fellowships for all of our students who are doing public interest work uh, for eligible employers. And that's up to $8,000 a summer. It's paid out on a weekly basis, so the more weeks you work, the more you get paid. And last year, just over 180 students received, um, and that's sorry, that was the summer of 2019, so one summer ago, received uh, funding for public interest work. And then I mentioned our career options assistance program, which is our loan repayment program after graduation. Uh, and that's a, a really generous loan repayment program. It's a repayment program, not a forgiveness program, which I think is a really important distinction. Uh, what that means is that every six months, we will send a check in the mail to students who are uh, eligible for a loan repayment based on their income uh, and you can come into the program you may eventually income out but it's not like the public service loan forgiveness program run by the federal government where after 10 years all your loans get forgiven it's sort of incremental so you can stay in for you know three years and have some percentage of your loans uh, repaid during that period until you income out after that and that's a complicated program I could answer. I, in fact, do entire hour-long sessions just on loan repayment, so I won't belabor that for right now, but if people have questions, I can certainly answer them. Okay, financial aid is complicated, and I, I guess the one thing I'll just say about that is you should, the devil's in the details with all financial aid at all law school, so that's more just a broad overview, and you should definitely think really carefully about financial aid um, and ask detailed questions when you're really comparing schools. All right, I'm going to get into the application um, in a little bit more detail because obviously this is about law school admissions and that's what I'm here for. So I'll start with a little application checklist. So uh, our application is going to be available really soon on September 1st, but you can't actually click submit until October 1st. And our application deadline is going to be February 15th this year. Obviously, you have to have graduated from college. We require the LSAT or the GRE. Either one of them is totally fine. Uh, and you accept two letters of recommendation is what we require. You can submit up to four, but no more than two is needed. We have two required essays, a personal statement, which is usually just the one that you submit to other schools. And I'll talk a little bit more about the Yale specific 250 word essay, which is something that should not be intimidating. I know people get a little freaked out by it, but it's really not a big deal. And then there's some optional materials as well that some people choose to submit. And then I suspect many of you will want to choose to submit in particular a diversity statement. And I'll go through each of those in a little bit more detail in a moment. So I'll talk a little bit about our review process because I think it's pretty different from what a lot of schools do. So there's a first read by admissions, uh, and that means me or Eric or someone else on our team will read every file cover to cover, and then one of three things can happen. So either we decide it's not going to move on, and that's about 75 to 80 percent of the applications we receive, or we can decide in a tiny, tiny handful of cases, and you should not really aim to be in this because it's so unusual that it's um, one of just a tiny handful of just really exceptional applications of the year and those get admitted after a single faculty member reviews the file. The vast majority of people we accept go on to standard faculty review which means their file is sent to three faculty members. They read those files individually and independently of each other so they don't know who else is reading the file. They score them and so um, they score them two, three, or four, and we add up those scores, and depending on what the score is, we either admit or we reject, or we kind of keep them in a holding pattern until later, and the vast majority of those applicants in the middle end up waitlisted. So that's the review process. One of the really unique things about that process is that there's no advantage to applying early at YLS. Our faculty are on a curve, and so we're intentionally creating acceptances at an equal rate throughout the cycle. So there's no pressure at Yale to apply early. You can uh, apply on deadline day, and you will have an equal chance of being admitted. So that's an important thing to, to be aware of. 
Okay, letters of rec, we talked about those a little bit already. Definitely an academic focus because faculty review is such a key component of our review process. Some things to look for that we look for in letters, specific is better. Um, and actually I'm gonna have a, I'm doing a podcast with my colleague, um, Christy Jobson, who's the Dean of Admissions at Harvard. We have a whole podcast episode coming out about letters of rec. So if you want tons, tons more information, I encourage you to listen to it because we kind of go off and off about, about letters of rec. So these are just some really like high level tips. Um, also for us, because faculty uh, are, are the primary audience, if you're a strong applicant, again, these academic letters matter. Um, I think it was Samantha asked a question before, and this probably applies to many of you. You've been out of school for many years. You can't go back and ask for those letters. Totally okay. We totally get it. No big deal. Try if you can to get an academic letter or two. If you can't, just ask your recommenders to really talk about academic skills. Uh, critical thinking, research and writing, those kinds of skills rather than purely professional skills uh, like uh, multitasking, running meetings, those kinds of things. So make sure that you get into those more academic characteristics in those letters if you can. Um, and you don't need more than two letters. Don't go bananas. If you have an extra letter that's going to be additive rather than duplicative, absolutely feel free to include it. The personal statement, no need to write a Yale specific personal statement. It does not need to have a why Yale element to it. That's not something that we require or look for at all. Um, the way I think about personal statements is there's often personal statements that are past focused, sort of about background identity. There's personal statements that are really present focused. What am I doing right now, either in school or in my working life? And then future focused, focused on what kind of lawyer I wanna be, what my interests are in law school. The best personal statements tend to kind of have some movement to them. So how your past is informing your future, how your present is informing your goals in law school. So rather than just feeling really stagnant and still, being about a single anecdote Anecdote, something that really kind of has some movement to it. So that's if you're struggling with thinking about the personal statement, maybe that gives you a little bit of guidance to it. The other thing I'll say is that there's a pretty wide playing field for personal statements. They are personal. Um, that's important that we get a sense of who you are as a person. Um, once in a while, they veer into a TMI sort of zone of like, whoa, you know, because this is still professional school. Being TMI has nothing to do with topic, it has to do with tone. So you really just wanna make sure that your tone, even if you're writing about a sensitive subject, is a professional tone. And that's really key. And that middle ground of being personal so we get to know you, but being professional enough that it feels appropriate for a professional school application, that's a really, really, really wide zone in the middle. And you just wanna make sure you stay within it. And most applicants do very successfully. 250 word essay that, um, sort of bold, bolder language is the prompt. That is what we are looking for you to write about. An idea or issue from your academic, extracurricular, or professional work. So number one, be responsive. Don't write about something. That's, a, that's really broad. But some people still don't answer the question. And that's always just like, come on, like, like table stakes, answer the question. So does not have to be law related at all. We're looking to kind of get a sense of, A, the kinds of issues and ideas you care about to learn a little bit more about you, and also to get a sense of how you talk about ideas and issues, how you think about them, how you approach them, because that gives us a sense and gives our faculty a sense of how you might engage within the community. So that's hopefully gives you a little bit of guidance about them. And we got some great ones last year. It used to be a broader prompt that had no real guidance and people really struggled. The prompt is intended to give some guidance and to be helpful to applicants. And I, th I think it really did help last year. Okay, those are the statements. Addenda. I am an addendum minimalist. I could spend half an hour talking about why there's way, 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 way too many addenda in the world. If there is a very significant external event that had a major impact on your application, you should include an addendum. I'll give an example. My father uh, passed away when I was in college. I could write an addendum that said something like this. This is true. My father passed away my junior spring in college. Um, it had a, an effect on my grades that semester. See, by senior spring, I had recovered from um, that experience and my grades improved again. Short, succinct, what happened, what was the effect, then it's over. It's, that's it. I, no drama, nothing that's like small potatoes. There's a really big difference between explanations and excuses. There's not a lot of gray area. I don't want to hear excuses. 
It just is bad judgment. So really, really be careful um, about what you're choosing to write an addendum on. It's not an extra essay. It's a brief explanation of something um, external. Here's another example. If you were not participating in extracurricular activities because um, you, know, you had caregiving responsibilities or you had to work to support yourself through college, we need to know that. Or you were in, um, you know, that's something that we want to know. That's different than, oh, my, my roommate broke up with their boyfriend and I had to spend that semester comforting them. Like, this is the kinds of things that I read. And it's like, pff, like, no, not a cute look. All right, enough about that. Character and fitness issues, read the question carefully. If it needs to be disclosed, it should be disclosed. If something is serious, the more serious it is, the longer the disclosure should be. You should always take responsibility for it and show that you've moved past it. Very, 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 very few things are deal breakers. You should never take yourself out of the game because of a character and fitness issue. If you're in doubt, just disclose it. We've admitted people with very significant um, justice involvement. We've admitted people with significant um, academic disciplinary issues. So don't be stressed about it. Just take responsibility, be forthcoming about it, and let don't take yourself out of the game because of those things. Okay, um, diversity statements, we, those can be focused either on, uh, on, really on any aspect of your identity that's core to who you are that's not otherwise covered in the application. Um, that can include obviously your experience in the military and we do get a lot of those. So I really encourage you to make sure that you, you, you explain to us um, all aspects of your experience, your identity, your background that will give us a really well-rounded picture of who you are because we wanna know how you're gonna contribute to our community. I kind of think that's it. I'm gonna leave it there and then we'll try to get some questions. I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay, cool. All right. So I see one question, but I'm gonna really kind of try to encourage you guys to ask questions for our students first. So I'm gonna say, I'm going to give you a second to type because I'm sure you have questions. This would be the only presentation in the history of time with only one question with this many people. So you can feel free also to like do the hand raise. I don't know if that's possible in this thing because that could be kind of fun. Okay, so I'm going to throw this on. So I'll moderate a little bit. So Annie, this one's for you. Can you expand on serving in the reserves while attending law school? <laughs> so I'm in a unit in Middletown. Um, they know that I'm in law school. And so they really try to um, make sure that I don't miss anything. So if I tell them I have an exam or something of this sort, I do this thing called RST where I fill out paperwork and then make out the day, make up the days beforehand. Um, this summer I was working in Honolulu for my summer internship and I missed all of our annual training. And so now I'm making that up. I'm just going in from eight to four roughly, um, but I am missing class. So um, there are benefits that most of the time they try to cater to you, but in certain moments, like when missing an entire AT, um, you have to give them something. Yeah. Is that what you needed, Charles? Thank you. I got a good thank you. Okay, great. All right. So Samantha asked what kind of flexibility is there during the 1L year? And I guess I'll throw that to Paul because he was more recently a 1L than, than Tristan. So the first semester is 100% is dictated to you. It's four classes, you don't get a group your professors, you don't pick your small group, any of that. So that part of the schedule is codified. How much time you spend studying and how much time you need to spend studying varies from individual to individual. You'll hear some people say there is way too much to do uh, in all four classes, and Marian, cover your ears. And so you should pick two or three courses that you wanna do well in and really understand, and, and then let one go to the wayside. I don't, I, I think that there is time to do all of those things um, and, and, and be able to maintain them. But it is a full-time job if you want to do well in what we call black letter classes, which are your four unit classes that just take up more time because it's just, it tends to be more reading intensive. So it's, uh, well, what did we used to say? That it's only a lot of reading if you do it, but it's also, like if you want to understand it, you have to do the reading and 
hopefully by the time you guys come back, there is cold calling. The vets traditionally do very well with cold calls, and it's actually fun for us, the state is part of us. Uh, so that being said, uh, a classmate had a child two weeks into the first semester and was able to balance and still did well and still participate. So anybody who else has ever had to deal with a newborn, like, you know, how much time and how much sleep do you lose with that? And he did great. So, you know, budget your time. And for everyone here who's had a full-time job, you, you can you can still have a life. Uh, but And I think uh, one or two professors that I had uh, commuted their entire three years because their family was living in New York. Um, and it was, it needed to be done. And then they were able to make that commute work for them. They did it on the train, they did their homework on the train, and there was just some late nights for them. Um, but you can make it work. Having a part-time job your first semester, probably not gonna happen. Though. Yeah, and then, and I'm, I completely screwed up. I should have had everyone introduce themselves, so I'm gonna go back and do that. And then I'll just note and say that the second semester of first year, you can take whatever classes and clinics you want. So that's like total freedom. So that first semester is totally set. And that second semester, which is very unusual for law school, is total flexibility. Okay, so I'm going to let Tristan introduce himself first because he's our one 3L. So he's like the senior member of our of our admissions team here today <laughs> and has the best beard. Sorry, Paul. <laughs> oh. <laughs> give him a point. Some, some people trim and look good and some girlfriends live on the opposite coast. <laughs> I um yeah hi everybody my name's um, Tristan I'm a 3L I uh I was in the Air Force I was disappointed no more Air Force came this year but you know I don't get to pick them so I'm just kidding I but uh <laughs> next year Tristan I promise next year <laughs> um, but I uh I completed my undergrad at Brown um I was uh, prior enlisted and then and then I went to school and then at the at the law school. And I'm also a JD ambassador with service to school. So, you know, I, I do help out. I do help out that way as well. Um, uh, at the law school, like Miriam said, I'm in my third and final year. Uh, it is interesting being hybrid, but I'm, I've found this first week. My first week came to an end today. Y'all are my like final thing. And then I'm going to enjoy my first weekend of my last year of class. Um, but I, Yale's done a really good job of making this transition. Um, a, a handful of classes are still in person. I'm actually at home in Florida right now. Um, and then the only other thing I was going to say, because I saw somebody mention something, and we can come back to this. Um, and I'm also in the Veteran Legal Services Clinic. So in a little bit, I can talk more um, about what it's like working in the legal clinics. But it's my understanding, and uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Yale is the only law school that allow, and it has to do something, I think, the Connecticut constitution or something that allows law students to in their first year in their uh in their second semester to start representing clients which i think is a really cool uh distinction uh that yale has um but yeah that's me great to meet everybody thanks tristan all right annie i'll let you go next hi all i'm from rural pennsylvania i was enlisted and i did the reserves uh, my first like my junior year of high school my senior year and then I took a national ROTC scholarship and I did uh, four years of ROTC at UCLA and then I went to Intel school and now I'm here fulfilling my reserve contract. Uh, at school I do the Veterans Legal Services Clinic. Um, I'm not sure what else to say but that's me. Thanks Danny. All right Paul. You're up. Hi. My name is Paul. I grew up in California. I was a Marine officer for 12 years. I'm currently co-director for service to school JD operations. So if any of you see emails from me, that's why. Uh, and, I, and I do have to give a quick plug. Anybody who's still in, if you have troops who are even considering school, get them hooked up with service to schools because that's the focus of our mission. And, and looking back, it was one of the things I wish I'd done better with, with my troops was help them transition and, and service the school reason we volunteer for it is because of the gap that it fills. Cool. All right, so I see like a whole bunch of questions clustered around involvement. So including clinics and, you know, centers, like I see a, a shout out to the Center for Global Legal Channel, Ch Challenges and national security staff and all that kind of stuff. So maybe if each of, each of you guys could talk a little bit about just the, 
the student groups and any centers or any clinics that you're involved in and just give a sense of sort of the opportunities that are available. And I'll just do the, the same order. So I'll start Tristan and then Annie and then Paul. Yeah, I, um, uh, I'm in the Veteran Legal Services Clinic with, uh, with Annie. I primarily work, uh, my, my, client, my client matter focus is uh, particularly towards VA benefit claims and discharge upgrades. Um, it's really cool. I've yet to see how this is going to work now in the age of Zoom, um, but you do get one-on-one -on -one client interaction. Uh, several of the other cases, and Annie will be able to speak a little bit more to some of this, we have class actions going. Uh, one of our colleagues will be arguing next week. Uh, I don't know if it's for one of the class actions, but nonetheless, arguing in court. Um, and it's a really cool experience. Through the, vet, through the vet's clinic, though, in your first summer, uh, you can sometimes go work for a law firm, but Yale really, re Yale really like endorses like going to work for like nonprofits or maybe working in the state or the government. And then in your following year, going to work for a firm, if that's the, if that's the route you wish to go. And um, through the Vets Clinic, I actually had the opportunity to work at the National Veteran Legal Services Program down in uh, Washington, D.C. And um, again, that's a high impact organization. So it's not, uh, they, they do larger things. And they also write the, uh, the Veterans Manual, which is like the Veterans Legal Manual, which is like the treatise for pretty much all veterans law. Um, and I got to participate in that. So the stuff ranges from like client work all the way down to helping like author these, you know, these massive manuals that go out that only lawyers read. Um, but it's a, but it, it is a really, really, uh, really great experience. I saw, uh, I see Caroline's question in there and I, I realize I've been talking a lot about the vet stuff I do. I take that as a personal interest, but my choice to go to law school is to go into like business and in particularly tax law. I think I'm on my like seventh or eighth tax course now. So we kind of, yeah, we picked a theme and we'll see, we'll see what comes of that. But um, the clinic is really cool because you can choose to do anything outside the scope of what you think you're going to end up doing. And we have a lot of clinics. All right, Annie, you're up next. So I do the Veterans Legal Services Clinic and I love it. Uh, the two cases that I got on to be on as a, second semester one out were Doe versus the US and that was a sexual assault case and um, we had oral argument at the second circuit so it was incredible to be uh, second semester one L like going through all these research questions that and like mooting with all of these alumni from firms and all these places that were like super invested in my team doing well um, at their oral argument at the second circuit and actually during COVID uh, we did it like over the telephone, which was super interesting and a little bit scary for us, but it was wonderful to see like a 3L, uh, like actually answer some of the research questions like we uh, like brainstormed so heavily. And then the second case that I was on, or my matter, uh, was also working with the National Veterans Legal Services Program. And we released a report saying that veterans serving in Guam for a certain set of years were more likely than not exposed to Agent Orange. And so hopefully veterans that are seeking um, benefits will be able to use our report. And so both of those things, I was super lucky that I got to work on because there were around 26 matters and uh, I was selected for those too. Uh, but yeah, I definitely, like this summer, I worked with other people from other schools and my friend from Harvard, she was like shocked that I got to be in a clinic this year. And I think that I learned that uh, like I came into my summer internship, like having already done like all this legal research, um, like for something that I felt like was very tangible. So I was super excited to be in the veterans clinic. Cool. Thanks so much, Annie. All right, Paul. Do you want to stay with the same question or go with a different one? Um, I, well, I don't know what you've been doing. I feel like you're a man of mystery. You know, I always tell you you're a man of mystery. Oh, okay. well, we, we only talked about the clinics, but you're familiar with the Paul Tsai China Center. and some Yeah, why don't you talk a little bit about centers and, yeah, sure. and, so, you know, and actually business stuff, because I think some people are interested. I do know what you're doing this summer. Um, <laughs> so maybe talk a little bit about, like, the business corporate side of it. Sure. So, and I went the other direction. Instead of doing clinics, I got involved with a lot of clubs. Um, so I was in technical, uh, Technological and Law Society, the National Security Group, uh, obviously the VETS. Um, and a couple other uh, affiliated groups. There, there are so many things to do 
you will overwhelm yourself if you don't start saying no to things within the first couple of weeks, which is which is awesome because um, I, I took uh, a joint class with the Jackson Institute, which is our international affairs, and we had everything from congresspersons to Admiral Staff Reedus to people who it, are otherwise connected to Yale or through Yale alumni to come and talk to us uh, about whatever the subject matter was. So that was a, a cybersecurity and law course. Um, and, and so you do get these connections um, just, just by being part of, part of the group. Um, there's also uh, law and business. Um, we just stood up a uh, innovation and entrepreneurship clinic. So anybody who's looking to go that route, it does both uh, M&A and PE type work. But then it also does uh, the initial chartering work for... Uh, Tell them what PE is. Not everyone knows. Oh, um, I'm sorry. Private equity and venture capitalism. And then uh, M&A is uh, mergers and acquisitions. So what we tend to do in those instances is help people actually go through the process of how do you either get acquired or, or create an organization to start acquiring things. And it's very interesting to watch them do it. You see... Uh, they'll link up with student entrepreneurs either at the School of Management or even uh, some places up in Boston, especially on the tech side, like at MIT. And you'll be doing legal work pro bono um, under the auspices of a lawyer. And, and, and so it's a lot of fun. And uh, to, to go even more divergent for your summer, you can do, and, and this is a great program, this is one of the only schools that will actually pay you or subsidize your work for public service, um, which, which is a wonderful thing. But then you can also go work for uh, a law firm. I worked in-house counsel um, and because I wanted to focus on cyber-related things, and that was, that was an instance. But the way I was able to get that was a combination of uh, backgrounds, networking, and shown interest, and you just have that platform that doesn't necessarily exist otherwise. Cool. Yeah, and I will say that a lot of the firms um, and some of these private sector employers, a lot of them are really trying to recruit vets. And so I know that for Paul's employer, they often won't hire one else, but be, they have a special recruiting program for vets. And so that's something that I think all of you should know, and you should really take advantage of. You shouldn't feel boxed out just because some place says, oh, we don't hire one else. Often they will make an exception um, for vets because that's a, often a very big hiring priority for them, which is, which is super cool. Um, so Tristan, do you know what you're doing after graduation? I don't want to put you under the gun, but we got a post-grad employment question. Wait, can I brag for him? Yes. Pre <laughs> I, I love bragging for so, others. Uh, Tristan didn't even do his internship this year. They just said, you're so good. We are going to hire you sight unseen minus like the four interviews he had to do. And so he's going to go work at Sullivan and Cromwell. Wow. Seriously? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Wait. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I want to do the round of applause thing. Tristan, that's amazing. Congratulations. I, I really, I really do appreciate it. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited. Um, it'll be, you know, and it'll be in New York, Lord willing, if, uh, if everything starts going back to normal. A lot of people are starting remotely this year, but uh, um, ideally I'll come as no shock from what I've told you. I'll be in their tax group. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited. Sullivan and Cromwell is an absolutely unbelievable firm. Um, and I've not, I'm, I'm very excited. Um, I, I, what the, I think what the question though, um, that is my after school plans. And what's really cool about law school from my experience, but I think Annie and Paul might echo something similar. I think Miriam might as well from her experiences. In your second year, I'm sorry, so in your first year, the law firms used to do this. It's gonna be a little bit interesting to see how they try to coordinate it this year, but they would come visit the schools and they would host receptions. And it's so that you could become familiar with the, um, the, the associates and the partners that are in the different firms. And you know, you kind of get a feel for like, oh, I kind of like, and I hate to use this word because it seems so like simple, but the vibe. And um, you know, you meet these partners, you meet all these people, you start talking about stuff. And then you, when you return for your second year, you go into interviews. Um, and you do a handful of things like that. And then uh, what you'll do for your second summer is work at a firm, if you wish to, by the way, not everybody, not everybody goes to big law or let alone big firms. They might stay in the corporate side, but maybe go small or like Paul mentioned, it could be public interest. A lot of people want to go work in, uh, work in government. Um, and then uh, you'll work for the summer. Like Paul said, I didn't have to do that this summer. Uh, and then they'll extend you an offer if they enjoy you and then you come on and it's kind of a really cool process. I think I, I really do enjoy how the law schools and the firms are kind of wedded like this. 
because while I'm, while I'm in my final year, you know, the sunset's approaching and I don't intend on ever returning to school unless I'm the professor. I, I think I'm done with school forever. Um, it's really cool to know that something is lined up and it, it's, it's really interesting not to have that kind of burden going, oh my God, what are we doing? What are we doing? Um, and so the, the way that this, Miriam, I don't know what I would call it, but like program works or how this- Yeah, on-campus recruiting, I think. How this yeah. relationship works, I think is absolutely, uh, absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. And did you find, maybe I'll just ask one follow-up question, because we did get a question about like on-campus interviewing. We call it OCI or on-campus interviewing pretty much. Like, how was that? Like, did you find it to be like smooth and you and you and your friends, because you've sort of been through it. And I know Paul and Annie, <coughs> if they choose, will be going through it later this year. Was it? So I had, I had a really uh, interesting experience and I did not do on-campus interviewing because of, uh, I received, I, I applied for a 1L position at the firm and the slots had already been filled. And so what they offered, and I had this coordinated with our o office of student, is it OSA that helps C us? CDO. Career CDO. development. <laughs> it's Close CDO. enough. <laughs> Too many acronyms. Um, I, uh, I had done my first interview, but they didn't have a slot available and they wanted me to come. But getting a 1L position is actually pretty difficult. Um, even at the law firms, they do have those programs. And so what they told me is that I could just go straight to a callback, which is your second round interview. And so at, after working with the CDO, because there are very special rules about doing certain things early, I was able to coordinate to do it early. That said, all of my friends that did it said it was very intense, but it was one of the coolest experiences they had that it was like, if you like interviewing or if you like having conversations and meeting people, I've heard it likened to um, interview speed dating. Um, you'll, you'll set up and you kind of work your way through. Um, and it did sound exciting. It sounds to me like if any of y'all are interested in like, you know, like throwing an elevator pitch, you get to go in and sell yourself and do a handful of things. So it's, it does sound like a very exciting uh, situation, but there are uh, alternate ways to do it. I, I, I don't know if that was helpful. No, that was super helpful. I think that's great. If anyone has follow up questions about that, um, my, my husband's on the other side doing the hiring. So I like see it from both sides now. So I'm happy to answer them too. Um, okay. So I'm just looking, oh, this is a great question. So uh, we got a couple of questions about adapting from the military to the, to the Ivy league or from going back to school as a non-traditional applicant. So I'm wondering, um, maybe that's a good one for you, Paul, because I think you might have been out for the longest before coming back, you're the least traditional of the non-traditional, so I'll, I'll pitch that one to you. So on day one of orientation, when the when Dean Gherkin, who's phenomenal, uh, is, is walking us through the class, she says, you know, if you're this person, stand up. If you're this person, stand up. And, and then she said, okay, if you're more than eight years out of college, stand up. And there was like five of us. And uh, she said, these people, insert old people, are the people you should ask when you get stressed. And you guys will be those people, whether it's eight years or five years, I think the military gives you dog years. Um, and then another anecdote, uh, somebody I was interning with this summer, her comment, and she goes to Georgetown about Yale you know, was, it's the most liberal place that I've ever been in my life. Um, I don't find that to be true when I'm speaking to a military audience, but it is still a university. And you are going to get a myriad of thoughts and you are going to get a, a lot of views that, that people have varying degrees of experience they're going to express. You are going to be some of the older people to bring a different perspective. And that's one of the reasons you're so valuable. Uh, and I mean, they're great people. I mean, the vets are great people. Uh, the, the clubs that I hang out with are full of just wonderful people, many of whom are smarter than I am, so I'm learning from them every day, actually all of them probably. And, and, and that, that level of exposure makes you better. And you make the situation better by bringing in your experience and, and, and hopefully some of the leadership uh, through the more difficult conversations you're going to have about the law and about the country. And, and I, I think that that's just a good thing. So is there a transition? Absolutely. And that's one of the reasons why leaning on the other vets is, is hugely helpful. Can I add to Paul's? Uh, I was just about to say, Tristan or Annie, what do you want to add? So that's oh, perfect. I, I, one of the transitions, so I, like I said, I was enlisted, um, did, did uh, a couple tours in Iraq and this and that. And then I, I even lived in Afghanistan for a couple of years as a contractor. And one of my biggest concerns wasn't even just my age. It was worrying about 
going to a location that on on average, on above average, the my 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 you know sister and brother colleague would not have the same experience as I do, and it was going to be how do how do I do this and i was very nervous and that ended up not being the case either in my undergrad or at yale because by the time most people reach even straight throughs um by the time people reach grad school they're coming here with such a, a such a mass amount of different experiences that it doesn't seem like or at least i did not feel i can only of course speak for myself but like i did not feel like such an outlier on a positive note though one of my favorite transition things was is you only test once a year. You, you study all semester and then you test at the end. And when it comes to like, what's your flexibility? Like I'm a part of the, well, we're not gonna do it this year. I, great year to become captain of the softball team. But, uh, but you know, I did softball the last couple of years. Um, part of the Yale Veteran Association, the Federalist Society. You are able to juggle all those things because outside of regimented or the scheduled class time, Studying is on your own. And so if you're able to set yourself a regimen or a schedule, which I have found in my experience, the military kind of uh, pounds that one into you. Um, you actually, it, it, that was really easy. I've had, uh, you know, I have friends and colleagues who have really difficult times, uh, time, I don't want to double it. I have a difficult time doing time management. And that was something I don't, I've never run into. I'd be curious to hear Paul and Annie. I was able to set a schedule and it really, it makes life so much easier and you can go do, like Paul said, you gotta learn to say no, you can go do all these things. Um, and so that was one of the coolest transition things I, I was able to pick out was that, I don't know, discipline. <laughs> what about I, you, Annie? Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, please go uh, ahead. Okay, thank you. I would second what Tristan said. I mean, I'm the least, I'm like the, I'm only a year that I had and in that year I was doing army training but all of undergrad I had to get up really early for RTC and then all of my gap year was doing army training and so I guess it was like a really structured time for five years where I was up at five knew what, exactly what I was going to do like every minute of undergrad um, and then the same thing with the time that I was training and then coming to Yale uh, yeah, we have so much autonomy. Um, we're able to pick our classes the second semester, just totally cater our schedules to what we want to do. And like to echo the others, you can find because you have all this time all of a sudden that you're signing up for everything. Uh, and so just having that balance uh, was something that I needed to figure out for myself. But I'm really glad at the same time that like for the first time in my life, I have like autonomy over every minute. So I know we've gotten a couple of questions about involvement in the vets group and, and maybe, and, and all of you have touched a little bit on sort of about that community. And I'm wondering if maybe someone can expand a little bit on what the community is like for vets at the law school and also within, I guess, the broader, I know Paul, you've, and maybe Tristan as well, maybe you too, Annie, have even expanded within to the broader Yale community in terms of the vets community. And then someone also asked about if we have any JAG folks at the law school. And I, I actually don't know. I think we might have one incoming student who's a, who's a JAG person, but I'm not entirely sure. But maybe one of you knows the answer to that, too. We have two that just graduated, uh, Danielle Zucker, I believe, and Alexa and Daya. One's going into the Navy JAG and one is going into the Army JAG. Um, neither of them are prior service, but they were super excited to do that. Um, I did, I mean, just anecdotal, I met with a lawyer at Skadden who graduated and he had to serve all of his JAG commitment, which was six years at the time. And they still told him they would hire him like six years from then. <laughs> but that's like really anecdotal. So I don't know that that might be like a once in a lifetime thing. But uh, yeah, we have a few and they're super excited. And they both interned uh, with the JAG their 2L semester or summer. Great. And Tristan, do you want to talk a little bit about the VETS community yeah. itself? Yeah, absolutely. This is kind of a fun call. So I was uh, one of the former presidents of the Yale Veteran Association. And we, you know, by, by good fortune, have two of the new officers, uh, Paul and Annie. Um, but the, the, the vets cohort as a group, when you get here, you're going to end up your small groups, which uh, Miriam covered in her, in her slideshow. You, it's pretty cool. You're going to have the vets as friends. I have a good relationship with all of them on occasion. Obviously, this has changed at the current moment, but we would obviously, we would make a point to go out three or four times a semester to go get dinner, go get drinks, like, you know, vets do well. We, we meet in bars. 
But then like when you get here and you meet the small groups, your small group kind of becomes your family. We didn't, we haven't really talked too much about that, but my small group was actually my closest group of friends in the first year because you share all four classes together. Um, if you're doing studying or you're doing uh, writing or you're doing like oral arguments, your first round of oral arguments, it's with them. Like you're experiencing it with them. Now as the vet association, um, well, and now I'm, now I'm with the, uh, this is the Yale Law Veterans student group. And then now I'm with the Yale Veteran Association that's over the group or over the whole school. But the student organization interacts with the other clubs, but we also host pre-COVID, we used to host like reader, like speakers, or like we'd have people come in and do books, or you know, we would um, do some outreach through with like the clinic or like local, like the, like the community and stuff. So there was some really cool, really cool stuff there. Um, and I'm gonna stop there because I'll pass it over to Paul and Andy to see what they have planned because it's very interesting with the way things are set up now. So I'm not. <laughs> Well, I have a great backyard and we have a rule that you can have 10 people. So we're figuring this out, but um, Paul is coordinating. He's you know, running the show, but yeah, I'm really excited to host the vets in my backyard, socially distanced. I love it. And he's going to be the game day player because it's a sweet backyard. So <laughs> I actually had my house passed down to me by uh, three vets that lived here. They were, um, three L's and then like it's really hard to get a row house because I live right beside the gym but it's closed but yeah they uh, let me like know and so maybe someday I'll pass my house down to you that would be so cool <laughs> I would love it all right this is a great question um, so I would ask each one of you to give some background on the application process and then any advice you have for applicants that's a question from Rodrigo thank you all right, so Annie, you want to go first? I remember your. I remember calling you to admit you, Annie. That was one of the most memorable ones of the year. That was one of my absolute favorites. You were so excited, and I was so excited. I actually was at Bullock, like I had just gotten back from the field when I got my call, and I just didn't believe it. I thought it was NYU, and I like like hung up the phone on accident. I called back. I was like, oh my God, I'm sorry. I was crying. And then I, I called like, from my New York self and my, my phone is a New York area code. <laughs> yeah. And I um, was like tying my boot and I couldn't be late to formation. So I said I had like two minutes. Like I couldn't believe that I was telling the Dean of Admissions at Yale Law that I only had like two minutes. <laughs> um, I was crying too. <laughs> uh, as far as my background, I think um, so I'm a fourth generation army soldier and I wrote like my Yale 250 on how my dad was like um, homeless during college and spent like like escalated through the army ranks but when he got to the Pentagon he like didn't know how to use a computer because he had paid someone else to type his essays uh, and I, it was just like something like he had met his match like he worked so hard his whole life um, and he just met that barrier. And then I think it was fluid with the rest of my education because, or my application, because in my undergrad, I did like a lot of education advocacy and things like that for low income students. And so like the Yale 250 for me was like something really special. And I like really didn't expect that it would work, but um, yeah, so I, I feel it. like- <laughs> I, I really remember it, it was amazing. It really like just brought out who you were and why you wanted to go to school. And it was spectacular. Well, thank you, Miriam. I don't want to tear up in front of all these people. So maybe I should pass the buck. But um, I just tried to write like professionally, but also explain exactly why I wanted to be a lawyer and why I was like so passionate about what I was doing and everything that I'd done beforehand. All right, top that, Tristan. <laughs> I, uh, oh, no. Um, I, uh, my, my experience was, uh, you know, she mentioned it in the PowerPoint. I, I was really skeptical about getting, in, uh, getting into Yale. I, I, honest, I honest to God thought I'd used up all my luck getting to Brown, and I figured it was just downhill from here. Um, but I, uh, at, the, at the behest of, like, some very, very close mentors, and I consider them friends more than that now, um, they were like, you still need to submit. And I submitted on the deadline. 
Um, and I'd, I'd never heard back. And, you know, I, for, in my experience, that may actually happen with some other schools. Like, you'll just not hear anything. Um, if I'm going to be rejected, I'd love for you to just say no. Um, but I, uh, you know, as time was going by, I was just finishing up. I, I had been accepted to another law school. And I was like, okay, well, at least we're going to get to go to law school. And I was actually in my undergrad, we were in the process of setting up a charity event for the Holly Charette Home in Rhode Island, which is the only uh, women's homeless veteran shelter in the state. And I got a random email while we were trying to coordinate this. And they don't typically email, they call, like Miriam said. And was it Craig who used to be? Craig, uh, the, the yeah, because uh, you were the year before I started, so it was it was when my spot was sort of empty. Yeah, so it was Craig. <laughs> it was a little scattered that year, I think. <laughs> so I get I get a poor call. Craig was doing like three people's jobs that year. <laughs> I get a call from Craig, who's a wonderful individual, but it's a it's a phone call from an area code I'm unfamiliar with at about eight at eight thirty at night. And so on a Saturday, which is early for Craig, he usually is like up till 4 a.m. <laughs> Craig, but like it's 8.30 on a Saturday and I enjoy my Saturday evening. So I'm not taking calls and I didn't think much more of it. And I'm very bad at voicemail. So like five days later, I get an email and it's like, this is Yale admission, blah, blah, blah. Like you need to call us. And I called back and I, it was absolute disbelief. He was like, yeah, you're in Yale. And I was like, no. I was like, no. I was like, you need to send the letter or something. And then like a few days later, Dean Gherkin called. Because I think she calls everybody, doesn't she? And she called and she's like, well, I'm the dean and I'm telling you. And I was like, yeah, and the other guy was the dean of admissions. Like, I need the letter. I, I, I need something tangible to, to know it's true. Um, but it was true. As far as the application, I've already talked too long. My favorite part was the 250. I, I, the personal statement, I encourage all vets to write a diversity statement. If you can do something that's not repetitive. I, if you can write, please write. Um, little asterisk not an addenda um but i uh the 250 was one of the coolest things i got to write about something so far outside of the military uh thing it was my ex i had some experiences while traveling in um, around asia and stuff and it, i would have never no other school gave me the opportunity to write about something like that um i was the older i think i was the last generation before they gave the writing prompt so it's a little bit different but you're going to be able to explore a lot there all right, Paul. I will say, so Paul, this is back in the day when we could still have on-campus appointments. And so I remember Paul was one of my most memorable. I remember he came to my office and we schmoozed. And then when he finally applied, I was like, I liked that guy. <laughs> he was very charming. I don't know what else to say. Um, no, I mean, What's the next questions? You don't want to talk about LSAT boosts, I don't think. I feel like you have lots of application advice. I'm gonna, I'm gonna cold call you. I'm gonna press you. Okay. Give a couple of tips. Um, if you're on this uh, this Zoom call, you're probably going to be applying to T14 schools. Most of the admissions and the fact that that Miriam's taking this time is, is significant, but most of the admissions appointments are all gonna get thousands of essays in front of them. And so that's why it, it, I, I, be thematic with your application. So with your personal statement, write about one thing and a story and about who you are. With your diversity statement, I usually recommend that the diversity statement is the military focused one and the personal statement is, is, is otherwise focused, but, but connect them thematically and then with the 250, Yale kind of gives you a, a, a lark where you can go off on something else. But it shows coherence. It shows that you have forethought. It shows that you can put together a package and then make yourself memorable. Because at the end of the day, every admissions is looking at their school. It's a place that they want to work. And they are gatekeepers. And ultimately, the question is, is this someone that I want to be associated for, with for the rest of my academic career? And so you do want to present the best form of yourself because when you graduate, like when I graduate, Miriam and I will both be Yale alum. And she's stuck with that for until something happens to me. And you, you got to, I'm trying to be funny, but you've got to remember that. And you want it, you want these people to see all of who you are. And, and the only way you can do that when there's thousands of applications is to have well thought out stories that are memorable 
And you know, it, that's why having that diversity statement and that 250 or an addendum if it's necessary, you wanna get all of that in front of them because that creates a more complete picture of who you are. So I, that, that, that's, that's a big one for me. Yeah. So we got a really good follow-up question from Stephanie about what Annie said, which is that it's people often get the advice, you know, focus on yourself and don't tell stories about other people. And I, I do think that that's good advice. I don't think what Annie talked about was a story about someone else. I mean, she talked about her dad, but only insofar as how her dad was her inspiration for her own work, for the educational advocacy work that she did when she was in college, and for the work that she was planning to do as a lawyer, and as her inspiration for going to law school. So no, don't tell a story about how that feels disconnected from yourself. But I think that the way that Annie told it and what made it so powerful is it connected past her background and her family and her identity to her present, the work that she was doing at the time, this educational advocacy work, to her future, the kind of work she wanted to do as a lawyer and to her interest in law school. And so I said before, you know, past, present, future, you want your application, doesn't have to be just in a single essay, but you want your application as a whole to give us all of those things. Past, present, future, hopefully connected in a coherent way. And I'll say one more thing about that, show it, don't tell it. So with Annie, and I'm sorry, Annie, to put you on the spot like this, but I think you kind of like give me a good example to work off of. It's much more powerful to say um, I'm interested in educational advocacy and to prove that by pointing on your resume to the work you did in college, actually advocating for low income students. That feels authentic and real and powerful versus just saying, I'm really interested in international human rights, but every single thing on your resume is corporate totally good and authentic and awesome to say, I love tax. I was working in a low income, you know, in a, in a clinic for, um, you know, doing tax preparation work. And, you know, that's, I wrote an essay, you know, I was a finance major and I wrote a thesis on like this arcane tax loophole. We love to admit people who are super into tax. Like we think that's awesome, but don't tell me you're interested in human rights when everything in your resume screams tax. Don't tell me you're interested in tax if everything on your resume screams national security. Like, it's okay also to change your mind and to have multiple interests and to have pivots in your career, but you want to make sure that the things you're saying and the things you're showing are at least somewhat consistent. Does that, I hope that answers that question. Thank you, Steph. I've got to thank you from Stephanie, so I'm going to stick with it. Um, so, can I add one more thing real quick? Yes, of course it? you can. So, so this is what I tell, um, like when I get paired with somebody and, uh, sorry for that, when I get paired with somebody through service to school, um, and even people who don't use service to school because they're not veterans, they like maybe went to like, you know, maybe they're with my alumni or something like that, is the GPA and uh, uh, the LSAT score. I don't know the comparison, the LSAT to GRE, Miriam would have to talk about it, but those two scores often intimidate a lot of people. And I'm really grateful she showed you all the slides because not maybe you weren't necessarily the greatest test taker or maybe standardized tests aren't your best bet. And um, I'm really happy when she shows the lowest scores to show that that's just, I think the, I think a, a larger overarching theme of our entire conversation here is those two things are just very small check, almost a check the box. Did you get a GPA? Did you take the LSAT? And then Yale does a really great job of then focusing on who's the person. Um, and so my, my LSAT and my GPA were lower than the medium, uh, or sorry, the median. Wow. But, and that really, that really had me nervous. But after the experience and having worked with admissions and service to school for so long, I know those are just but two little facets of the larger application. So don't get hung up if it's not the, a 180. You didn't get a perfect score. Like that's, that's not a deal breaker. And just always keep that at the back of your mind. I, everybody I work with, they're always worried about that. So I'm going to say some things about that. And Eric, if you'll send me any test-related questions, I'll do all the test-related questions now. So the first thing is, LSAT and GPA matter only because we need to make sure we're admitting people who are academically going to be good for, you know, prepared for the school. And there are two data points um, that help us with that. There are other data points um, that matter a lot for that too. So first of all, the GPA is like, a top level data point, but there's a lot going on underneath that, including how much grade inflation was there? Is there a graduate record? So some people will go to school when they're 20 and then, you know, that wasn't there. They weren't so into it. They were kind of slacking off. They were partying a lot. And then, you know what, they go to the military, maybe they get their life together. Then they go to graduate school and they have a much better graduate record. And so we can kind of say, well, 
that's not so reflective of how they're going to perform academically in law school, we can look at that graduate record and say, clearly they've changed. So the GPA can be pretty misleading. We look and as I said before, the service academies are a perfect example of that. I look at every class on the transcript. So I'll give another example. Sometimes people will start in a STEM major. And I was a STEM major, so this always kills me when this happens, but I know it happens a lot. Then they hit that organic chemistry, they get the C, and then they pivot to the social sciences or the humanities, and they start to do much better. Okay, so we can discount the grades that they were doing poorly in organic chemistry, the physics, the whatever it was, and then you can see the really, really, really strong grades after that. So we're not just looking at a top-line GPA number, we're really parsing the transcripts undergraduate and graduate extremely carefully to really assess whether this is someone who can be academically successful at the law school. The letters of recommendation are also really critical to that. The test scores are a piece of it. But nothing is really disqualifying. The only thing that's disqualifying is if you don't apply. If you don't play, you can't win. So really put yourself in the running and trust that like we are really, really, really looking to admit service members. That is really critical. And we're trying to give everyone the benefit of the doubt. And it's a really holistic and contextual review of every application. Um, so I'm not a big believer. So we have this question about whether there's like a reach score or there's like an LSAT boost. It's much more holistic than that. So it's not like we're like, oh, this is a vet. So I'm gonna take their LSAT score and add three points to it. That's just not the way it works. As I said, the threshold question for us is, is this someone who can be academically successful at the law school? Once I feel comfortable with that, we're then kind of looking to see is, if, is this someone who can contribute to our community? And the answer for people who are in the military is almost always yes to that second question. So you guys are already, that's why being a vet is a boost is because on the contributing to the community question, there's such a strong lean towards yes, right? Sometimes we get people who are high numbers, you know, they have a 180 and a 4.0, but you have this lingering doubt. Is this someone who's going to contribute beyond just being able to go to class and like do fine? I rarely have that lingering doubt with service members. We really don't because we know your experiences um, and your just what you've done and contributed already really make us feel very confident in the contributing to the community piece. That's where the boost comes from. Okay, so competitive range for GRE score. So last year was the first year that we took the GRE. Um, one of the biggest surprises for us, a hugely pleasant surprise with the GRE, is that we had tons of military folks apply with the GRE. I don't know why that was the case, but it was awesome. I felt so good about it. We thought it would be mostly academic types who were applying to joint degree programs. That was true, but it was also a ton of military um, applicants. So in terms of competitive range, it's what you would think it would be. It's high. We admitted, it was about the same rate of, admitted, of, of admission, so we admit just under 10% of our applicant pool each year. That was true for the LSAT. It was true for the GRE. And the scores it's similar to our LSAT scores in terms of the percentile. So you just wanna do as well as you can, but again, don't let it be the blocker for why you don't apply is if you think it's too low. There's no such thing as too low. It's one piece of data. There are tons and tons and tons of pieces of data in an application beyond the numbers. People fixate on the numbers because they're the only things that are firm. But for us, when we're reading the application as a whole, those other things are just as important and sometimes more important. Okay. I'll leave that there. Um, I, before I kind of turn to like more nitty gritty admissions questions and maybe I can even let um, Tristan and Annie and Paul like leave so they're not bored out of their skulls unless they wanna sit in and listen. Um, are there any other sort of like student specific questions that we either covered but maybe not deeply enough or ones that we missed that you wanna just retype into the chat box? Miriam, and, Ernesto, Ernesto has a cool question at least I, I asked the same thing when I was looking. That's a great question. Yeah. And I have a book recommendation and maybe everybody else has a different one, but there's a book called 1L by Scott Tarot, who went to Harvard. And I think he went to Harvard in the late seventies. And while a lot of things of course have changed on campus all the way from student composition to just the law being taught. Um, I found in my own experience that a lot of that stuff was still true particularly sitting in on your first cold call and what it's like going from class to class. It's kind of like the, it's kind of like the more adult version of Legally Blonde. Legally Blonde made it sound really happy. <laughs> and, everything. and then Scott Tarot's like, yeah, through rose colored lenses, that's it, but this is it. But I found that book extremely helpful. 1L by Scott Tarot. Any others? So I, 
I'm not a trader. I'll, I'll rep YLF. Um, if you, if there's a, there's, there's a course on Coursera done by one of our professors. He's actually our, uh, we could have an air force Marine Corps shakedown right now too. I think uh, we, it was, later, <laughs> later, later, um, but, but done by Ian Ayers, who, who is our deputy Dean now. Um, and it's called, I believe the law students toolbox. Yeah. And, I, and it's a, it's a, if you can take it for free, you can audit it and you, you don't get to take uh, the test or anything, but it's about six hours of just great information. If like me, you had no background in the law and teaches you simple things like what is ex ante mean and remind you where our legal thought came from. And, and so regardless where you go to school, um, it's, it's a great, it's a great prep um, that do over the summer before you start your school. Annie, have you got any? Uh, I don't have any book recommendations, but circling back to a question for a Virgo about unique opportunities that we get at Yale, I got to take a class at the Global Affairs, or Jackson, um, where it was like 300 people applied, and they only picked 20, and it was taught by John Kerry, but five of the people in the class were vets from all the schools, so he is great preference for vets because he himself was one and he would always call on like I don't have any um, deployment experience but he would always call on them for their deployment experience and he really valued their opinion so I mean just another reason to come to Yale like you get to be taught by people who like career servicemen and things like yeah. that. Yeah and there's also a program for Cary Fellows um, and it's school-wide but every year a couple of law students are selected I don't want to jinx us this year. I'm going to knock on what is Carrie Fellows, which is a really cool opportunity run through Jackson again, the International Affairs School. Um, to, and again, that's just a, I don't know that much about it, but you might want to Google it. It's a pretty cool program as well. Um, and I see Ian has re-asked about whether we have any partnership with the UN or the WHO um, for students interested in working with those orgs over the summer. So I don't think we have a formal partnership, but I think that the international law opportunities that the law school are exceptionally, exceptionally strong. Um, we have something called the Shell Center, S-C-H-E-L-L, -L, um, which is sort of the umbrella organization for international law, um, human rights. There's a couple of other centers focused on international stuff. Um, the Gruber Center, um, the Center for Global Legal Challenges are a few others, but the Shell Center is a really big one. Um, and we have special summer funding in addition to SPIF, which is our summer public interest funding, run through Shell, which is for international summer um, internships, which provides additional funding. And I used it when I was a 1L. I went to a, an NGO abroad my 1L summer. So for things like health insurance and travel, um, which is which is really cool. And so we definitely have students every year who are working at big IGOs and NGOs abroad. And our faculty are just tremendously connected in all of those organizations. And they're really, really helpful at finding those jobs. So those opportunities are definitely available, both during the summer, but then also postgraduate. Like we have students who go to the ICC for clerkships. We have students who clerk um, at international domestic courts um, after graduation. So I'm Canadian. I clerked at the Supreme Court of Canada. People do things like that every year as well, which is really cool. I hope that's, that's helpful. If it my doesn't, re-ask it. <laughs> my roommate actually interned for the UN this summer. She was like popping in, but I don't know where she's at right now. Wait, who, um, who is it? Evelyn. Oh, uh, Evelyn. I was going to say she was a mixed trial, right? Yeah. Uh huh. She was um, just right here a minute ago, but so sorry. But I was waving. I was like, hi. I thought that's who it was. I wasn't 100% sure. She's uh -huh. amazing. Yeah. But there were at least four that I can think of the top of my head in the one L class, my one L class that were working for the UN um, in internships this summer. So, yeah. So, okay. These are good questions. Well, what it, is, it, what it, is your it, favorite it, restaurant we got? We got Paul has something more. Oh, it, there is a, a fellowship that Yale does every summer at the uh, International Criminal Tribunal. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. A couple of students did that. A very unique experience. You spend the summer in Europe. Uh, so that's, that's something that's out there. Uh, and I, I answered that question privately, but I said, uh, Olmo is the best bagel place in the area. Oh, yeah. Uh, crazy Fussy. Donut, Sheer Khan, and then I'm a, I'm a Pepe's guy, so Frank Pepe's. So. I'll fight you on that. I'm all about modern for pizza. Oh, man, that place is so disappointing. No, you're just wrong. And I'm all about fussy for coffee because I'm fussy about coffee. That's a great coffee shop. A crazy donut is, oh, and you have to go to York, uh, York Street because it's like. Uh, York yeah. side for. Yeah. Or York side. It's right for outside. For Greek salad. Before. Yeah. And the gyro is good. All right, Annie and Tristan, any to add to that? Oh, Atticus, Atticus Bakery. They have the most amazing bread and baked goods and it's in a bookstore. 
That's um, one of my favorite. I'm all about the arepas at Rubamba. <laughs> yes, yes. So I um, I am on the constant quest for the perfect hamburger. Uh, this is a life a life debt I've given myself, and I will tell you there is a place called Louis Lunch, and it is supposedly if you Google it, it is supposedly the uh, where the hamburger was invented. Um, you know, and it's you can only it's on top. I don't know. I like it. I can go for a burger, um, and it's that's very probably. unique and weird. You should guys should all Google it. Louis Lunch. It's very. Very weird. <laughs> Andrew, I don't know how I feel about your seconding of Pepe's. I'd be careful. <laughs> I also second Pepe's, but I... <gasps> I want to unadmit all of you right now. <laughs> I do have Evelyn right here um, if you want. Oh, yeah. Oh, I just want to say hi and wave to her. Uh, hi. hi. Hello, everyone. Good to see you. Wow. Good to see you, my beautiful roommate right here. Uh, so I love, by the way, that you two are roommates. Yay. That's like, so awesome. <laughs> what about Lulsa House? There's uh, five, of, five, five of us. Five of us. Yeah. Yeah. So someone had a question about the UN. I actually spent my summer working for the United Nations uh, criminal tribunals for um, at The Hague, but I was not at The Hague. I was in Houston and I was really fun. Um, and it was a different experience because I was not able to be there, but I did work a lot on, on um, uh, cases related to international criminal law. So that, that is also an option. And I did that through the Kirby Simons Fellowship Program. So there are opportunities at YLS to do um, human rights work and international work that is paid for by the university. Thank you, Evelyn. So good to see you. Can I pitch a question? Yes. Okay, cool. I'm, I'm like looking through everybody's faces and names and I recognize a, a lot of both. And I know that we have a lot of um, S2S applicants who are an undergrad right now. Um, so they have, you know, maybe two to three years, maybe one year to think about law school. Um, granted, you know, they are like a traditional undergrad who also has two to four years to think about it. But, you know, our vets, they're, they're a little forward leaning, so I know they're already prepared. But what else can they do to prepare for the application? What should they be thinking about? What could they even do for internships um, during the summer? Things like that to prepare them. Okay, so I think that's a great segue into some more application specific questions, which Eric is lining up for me because we've been ignoring them to the end, but we're not ignoring them, I promise. Okay, so this is great. So if you have a couple of years to prepare, I don't think there's a ton of things you need to do. The one thing I would I always strongly recommend is to really think about recommenders ahead. So, you know, once you're out, you're stuck with what you've got in terms of academic recommenders. If you're in school right now, you can be really thoughtful about building those relationships. So if there's a professor you really like, go to office hours or Zoom office hours a little bit more. Maybe take a, take a second class with them. Um, maybe choose the paper option instead of the exam option, just so that you're starting to build a relationship with someone so that when in a year from now or two years from now, you go to them and ask for a letter, you have all of that to build on um, and more to talk to them about. So that's the one thing that I think you can really do. In terms of the internships question um, or the extracurricular question, there's no right and there's no wrong in terms of internships or extracurriculars. You don't have to do anything specific. You should really follow what you're excited about. I think that when people write with passion and excitement that really comes through in an application, I think you could even hear just when Annie talked about it and from my reaction to it, how memorable that was because her excitement and passion about what she was doing really came through. If what you're excited about is something traditionally law like mock trial or you know model UN, that's great. It does not have to be that. It can be music, it can be service work, it can be something related to vets, it can be national security, it can be volunteer work, it can really be anything as long as it's what you're excited about. It is nice to see sustained commitments, leadership rather than just I'm a member of lots and lots of different things. So that's something to be thoughtful about too is to really maybe pick a couple of things and, and stay with it for a little bit of time if you can. Not everyone has that privilege or the time or whatever. Um, but that's really it. Other than that, just kind of do what you love, try to do well, try to develop those relationships with faculty. Okay, now I have a whole list. Of, I'm going to try to go through these relatively quickly. So how should you show that Yale is your first choice school? So yay, I'm 
it warms my heart to hear that we're your first choice school, but you don't have to worry about that too much. Um, not because we assume that we're everyone's first choice school, but because we admit people that we think we want in our community. And then we believe it's our, our job to convince you to come. So once we want you, we really, really, really want you and we'll like pull out all the stops and really try to convince you that we think you'd be a great fit for our school. You don't have to worry about convincing us that we're, we're your first choice. It's our job to convince you that we should be your first choice once we admit you. So don't stress about it. You don't have to have a YYLS or anything like that. Um, you know, we admit everyone that we think would be a great fit and that's, um, that's on, then it's on us. So that's, don't, don't stress about that too much. Um, so the why Yale is not assumed, but you don't have to include it. In terms of the why law, that's a trickier one. I don't think you need to, I think it's contextual. So for some applicants, it's really clear from their application as a whole why law. So if you're someone um, where, let's say your military experience, you were the legal officer. And when you were, you know, in college, you were involved in some of these more traditional pre-law activities. You don't need to kind of belabor it. Like I kind of can see from your application that law school makes sense. Versus me, I was like a biochem major with absolutely no pre-law activities, doing a ton of like STEM related thesis work and lab work my whole time in college, I did feel like it was more incumbent upon me when I applied to law school to answer the, the big open question about my application. Like, why the heck was I applying to law school? So you want to think not just about the why law thing, but what are the open questions in your application? And do your, it's like any job application. You want to tell the employer, tell the law school, if there's going to be a gap on your resume, fill it. If there's going to be a question that's unanswered, answer it. Don't leave us with big questions. If, you know, you had a major GPA drop one semester, if there's a big external thing that caused it, tell us in a very brief addendum. You just want to make sure that you're answering those questions if you can. Okay, so I just finished my degree and with many of my classes being online, can one of my letters of rec come from my squadron commander? So I'll answer that two ways. One of your letters of rec can definitely come from your squadron commander that's fine. We still prefer academic letters. And I think you should still try to get to academic letters. I think professors are going to go out of their way to try to be helpful to students, especially in this time of craziness with the pandemic. I think everyone understands how tough this is on all of you, and they're going to want to be supportive. If you try and it's just not possible, of course, that's totally fine. Um, but and maybe you include the squadron commander regardless as a third letter just because it's a it's a strong letter but i would um, try to get a second academic letter if you can especially if you're in school now because it does raise a little bit of question in our mind of if you're in school and you can't get two letters why um, and you don't want to have that question raised it's not disqualifying don't stress about it if you can't we it happens and people still get in but it's better to have it if you can even if it's kind of like you know Maybe not, you know, it's like an eight out of 10 instead of a 10 out of 10. Still okay, try to get that second letter if possible. Um, if students are currently enrolled in a graduate or an MBA program, should they still consider applying to law school if they've gone directly from undergrad to grad school and then want to apply? So you should apply to law school if you wanna be a lawyer or maybe a law professor. That's why I would go to law school. So if you're certain at this moment in time that going to law school is the next right step, and largely that would be if you want to be a law professor or a lawyer, um, I would definitely apply. If you're not sure yet, take some time and think about it. Um, but I wouldn't, I don't, I wouldn't worry about wor what we're going to think from an admissions perspective. I would more sit a little bit with your decision and think about, is this the right next step for me in terms of my career? Law school is a big investment of time and money and resources. You don't want to do it just because. You want to be really certain it's a good thing. We definitely have people come straight from other graduate programs all the time. It's no problem. It's totally, it can be really cool. Uh, but you just want to make sure that, that it's really what, what's right for you. So I, I think that's an it depends, which is a typical lawyer answer, <laughs> maybe not so helpful. Um, how long can you defer enrollment in case you're unable to separate in time? So we are, ex I'll give, the first thing I'm going to say is don't apply if you know for sure right now you can't start next year. So if you know for sure you're going to be in, you know, 
your, your service contract extends out beyond like next fall, don't apply. Just wait until you're, uh, you know, you, you are pretty sure that you'll be able to start. At least there's a reasonable possibility you can start next fall before you apply. That said, we're extremely generous with deferrals for military reasons. So, and I'll give a perfect example. In general, we have a very strict rule. We don't give deferrals if we admit someone off the wait list ever. The one time we'll make an exception for that, and we in fact had to do that recently, is for someone who um, was um, called up uh, and from the reserves off the wait list this year. And we had to give this person a deferral. And of course, we would do that. So we will always be extremely generous with deferrals for any military-related reason. Um, and we've, we've given multiple military-related deferrals this year. It was actually like a weird year. You guys probably know this better than me, where a lot of people were, were unable to get out on time and people were being called up. And so, as I said at the very beginning, we were expecting more <laughs> incoming students, I think three or four more this year, who all deferred out for military reasons. So don't worry about it. Uh, we'll be flexible. And we'll give up to a maximum of three years of deferral. After that, we just, we have a three years that is strict even for military reasons. We can't extend past three years. Um, partnerships in terms of dual degrees. So we don't have any formal dual degree programs except with um, our School of Management for a, we have both a four-year and a five-year, no, correct me if I'm wrong, Eric, we have a four-year JD MBA. We have two different programs. There's a three-year, thank you, Paul, three-year and a four-year JD MBA programs. The three-year is a very formal program. It's very rigid and structured. Um, usually you apply your 1L year into that program. Um, and the four-year, I actually think is a better program. Paul and I have talked about this. It's a little bit more flexible. It allows you to get a little bit more out of the best of both schools. Um, it's a more traditional joint degree program. Everything else you apply independently to both degree programs, whether the second degree is at Yale or at another university. We have students who are doing degrees all over the country at tons of other schools. Uh, and then we work with people individually to figure out how best to structure it. And I just had my fingers up for the four-year program with the Jackson Institute as well. That tends to be popular. Yeah, that's right. We, we do have a nice program with them as well. And we generally will let the student defer because they don't grant deferrals at all. Do you have something, Paul? Go for it. And something else for people who want to be academics, uh, there's a, a real brain trust of uh, law and economics people here. And so you do have a hand, handful who do a JD PD, uh, PhD. And I think that's a five year program. Um, but this is one of the best places in the country if, if you know you want to go into academia or you know that that's the type of public policy you want to do, it's also an option. Um, and yeah, and actually I'll just say that just reminded me, we do have one other program which is fairly well established, which is a PhD in finance, which if you want to be um, in academia in law and econ is actually a very, very, very good program. Um, and you apply as a law student into that program. Um, Professor Roberto Romano, who's like a really like top-notch corporate law scholar and runs our corporate law center, uh, runs that program and is like a real mentor to sort of like generations of corporate law scholars. Um, and she's, she's a, a big proponent and really supports the people in that program. We have a couple of students incoming this year who are going to be going into that program, I, I think, who are planning to go into that program. Um, okay, so one-on-one -on -one conversations. So we do have a way to set those up, sort of one-on-ones. You can go to our website. There's a connect with us thing. And then underneath that, it says speak with an admissions representative. And then there's a schedule to set those up. Let me just say, I kind of joked about Paul charming his way in. Paul got in because he was an amazing, excellent, super strong applicant, not just because he came and chatted with me as fun as that and not was. not charming at all. Not, not charming at all. No, not at all. Although he does give me scones. He did give me scones. After he was accepted, once he was a current student, I do not accept bribes, do not give us gifts. It's completely not accepted. Um, but those one-on-one -on -one appointments, they're not necessary. Like, Chatting with us one-on-one -on -one does not help your application in any way, shape, or form. Those one-on-one -on -one appointments are really intended as if you have questions. So if you have like a really kind of unusual circumstance, um, if you have questions that are sort of personal and you really want to ask them one-on-one, -on -one, if we haven't been able to answer those questions during this, we would love to have the opportunity to answer those. We want to make sure you get full support. Absolutely feel free to make an appointment. We post them and they tend to get filled like within a few hours because I think a lot of people think that they it's like I think an undergrad gives this impression that you have to show you're interested to get accepted 
we assume you're interested. You don't have to show you're interested. We don't track it. We don't need you to, to do it that way. It's really intended to be, if you have questions, we're there to answer them. It's meant to be helpful, not as a show of interest. So just please use them in that way because otherwise we, we can't keep up with the demand. <laughs> it's like supply and demand just don't meet. So that's for those. But we would love to talk to you if you do have specific questions that we can't um, answer. And we have tons of other events that are posted. We have an Ask a Law Student email account um, and all sorts of uh, hopefully helpful stuff that's up on our website. Um, advice for reapplicants or those with multiple LSAT scores. So Multiple LSAT scores, it's like data is data, right? So we look at all the LSAT scores. Um, I, think, I think that it shows persistence if you retake the LSAT, and I advise people that if to, to retake it, I hate to advise people to retake it because I know how awful it is to take it and how much work it is and how stressful it is, but I always say that if you have it in you to retake it and you think you've left a significant amount of points on the table, like to retake it if you can because you know, as unfortunate as it is, that's the world we live in where those scores matter and it's good to, to get the best score you can. Uh, we, we'll look at the whole trajectory of scores um, as part of our review. Um, but, you know, I, I have mixed feelings on the whole thing. So I, I don't know how helpful that is. Um, in terms of reapplicants, we view your new application as a new application. So sometimes I'll go back if I'm interested and review the previous application. Our faculty readers will not see the prior application. Um, I have access to those um, and everyone in the admissions team will. Sometimes I'll go back and look, sometimes I won't. It depends a little bit on sort of my holistic review and whether I, I believe it's important. Um, so I would just make sure you put your entire best foot forward in terms of your reapplication um, and really look at each piece of your application and think about, is this a part that I could improve or did I do the absolute best that I could last time? And, you know, the other thing that I'll say is that there's a fair amount of, a little bit of randomness to our application. There are definitely, definitely people who we waitlisted that we would have loved to admit. You know, people go to the faculty review process and it can be a little bit of luck of the draw. You know, did you hit a group of three faculty members who really gelled with your application? Did you get a little unlucky and you were in a super tough group of 50 applicants and you kind of got faculty members who were vibing with other people a little bit more? So it's not necessarily saying anything super negative about you if you didn't get admitted. So it can be really worth reapplying. We admit reapplicants every year. So don't be too hard on yourself if, if you're a reapplicant. It, it's not. It, people are successful every year when they reapply. Did I get it? Are there any others? Um, I see one that I actually think is really important for v veterans or, or service members, which is our online classes view differently than traditional in-person classes. And then Definitely not. If, if you have a big gap in, um, like, like Paul said, eight years, um, d does, are you all weighing then that undergrad or are you saying, what did you do in the eight years between undergrad and law school? And then putting more weight on those eight years rather than undergrad. Yeah, I, I do think that we look, as I think I, I tried to say maybe sort of not so effectively before, we look at a transcript really carefully and we try to really parse what was going on. So, you know, we've definitely seen it where someone will go to school for a couple of years, not do great, and then there's a really long gap and either they go back to undergrad to finish it out or they'll sometimes go to grad school and there's a real um, pivot. You can really see a huge improvement. And yeah, of course we take that into account. Because, and sometimes it's the reverse, I'll be totally honest. Sometimes some people will do really well in undergrad and then they'll go off to grad school to a rigorous grad program and they won't do so great. And that's really concerning because we are a rigorous graduate school. And so if you're more successful in a less, you know, in, in a, in undergrad or in a less rigorous whatever program, but then when you hit, you know, hit the big leagues, you know, you don't do so well, that's concerning. So it, it works both ways, and we're looking at it very, we're parsing the transcripts really carefully. Um, and yes, an upward trend over time is very helpful, can definitely make up for, um, for doing less well at the beginning. Uh, and we do look at what people do in those gaps and how they do most recently um, to really weigh it. And like, here's another example. So, you know, if you're at a service academy and you did really, really, really well in every class within your major, but you were taking those required science courses 
And also everyone gets a C in survival swimming. Like I've never seen anyone get more than a C or a C plus in survival swimming. That's fine. Like we're not, we're not knocking you for the C in survival swimming. Like we're not knocking you for getting the, the lower grades in the physics when you were a political science major, because that's less relevant to whether you're going to be able to be successful academically in law school. Does that answer, Christine? I hope. Yeah, I think that's great. Now people are just wondering how many tattoos they need to get to get into <laughs> the school. Paul's <laughs> <laughs> setting a new standard for us right now. <laughs> well, for, for the Marines, it's easy because Yale's mascot's a bulldog. <laughs> My husband is only one, and I hated it when he got it in college. So this is a tricky hated one for it me. it makes it past tense, and now you love it because it's no. hard continue to hate ongoing hatred. <laughs> Peter's my, my buddy. I got to stick up for him. <laughs> he is your buddy. It's true. <laughs> All right. What have we got? Any tattoo, any tattoo questions from tattoos on up? Did we get them all? I'll give a minute just to see if any, anything else comes in. They, they can be small. They can be big. They can be silly. They can be These were great questions. This has been super fun. When will the slideshow and the recording be posted? So the this, this slideshow, what I'm going to do is after Christine and Casey send us the list of um, atten uh, attendees, um, someone from our office will mail out, not this specific slideshow, we'll mail you out like a, a bigger version of it. Um, and then I think Christine and Casey will be in charge of posting the video. Hopefully, edit please edit out anything I said that was terrible. Um, no, we will post it probably in, in the next couple weeks. So share it with whoever will find it helpful. Watch it again if you need to remember something. Um, and then always re you can reach out to the JD team at Service to School. Um, you can sign up for law school support on our website. Paul is one of our directors of our, our JD team. So you will probably end up conversing with him. Um, and he is very, very helpful. So. And I'm just typing into the chat, like my email address, and I'll put in Eric's too. It's just first name dot last name at yale.edu. And if you guys have questions that you think of later that are better to be answered sort of over email instead of in a, in a group environment. Um, and I see Tristan just put it, just please, please, please email us. Um, I know this is a stressful process and, um, you know, can feel really just intense throughout. And I really just want to try to as much as I can, like lower the anxiety level about this. All of you should feel really good about the place that you're in. You are all really desirable applicants. We are all rooting for you. We want you to be successful. We want you within our community. Um, and I'm speaking not just for myself, but for my peers at, you know, other really great schools as well. Um, and I think, you know, I have confidence that you're going to be really successful. So, um, you know, just put your be best foot forward really don't stress, don't sweat the small stuff too much. Um, you know, one type was not going to kill you. You know, there's no perfect essays. They don't have to be the best thing you've ever written. Just do a solid job and just trust that you're going to end up someplace really, really great. Miriam, can I uh, just add something real quick before we, before we get off? I strongly encourage everybody, you've heard it from Christine and Paul. Um, I'm one of the JD ambassadors. If you guys go through service to school, maybe we'll see each other again. And if that's the case, please tell me that you came to this. That'd be cool. Um, but, um, my email is on there. Feel free to reach out to me if you have just any questions or anything or you want to set up a zoom time to chat. I like Miriam and everybody's been saying, I really love helping with like vets, recruiting vets and getting more vets to be, uh, to schools like Yale. So really, I'm so grateful everybody joined. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, uh, Miriam, Christine, Annie and Paul, of course. And thank you so yeah. much. Thank you so much to Christina Casey for organizing and to Tristan, Paul, and Annie and to Evelyn. Say thank you to her too for, for being here. I'll let